fortunate to be joined by Adam Berner. Um, and uh, just to give you a quick bio about Adam, Adam specializes in mediation and collaborative family law and is the owner of Berner Law and Mediation Group with offices in Manhattan and Bergen County. And as a pioneer in the family dispute resolution field for the past 25 years, he has served as president of the Family and Divorce Mediation Council of New York and founding president of the Collaborative Divorce Association of North Jersey. In addition to his private practice, Adam serves as an adjunct professor at Cardoza School of Law, where he teaches mediation and collaborative law and serves on various training panels, including the New Jersey State Bar Association, uh, ICLE Divorce Mediation Training. Uh, and uh, we can see additional information about Adam by going to his website, at mediationoffices.com, and uh, it's, I'm thankful and appreciative that uh, we're joined by Adam Berner. Adam, thank you so much for joining us tonight. How are you doing? Glad to be. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Happy to share what uh, I feel very passionate about. Well, I would say with a bio like that, it seems like you certainly are qualified uh, in mediation. Um, and uh, I'll tell you that uh, even before you reached out to me, you uh, you were known to me, uh, unfortunately, in my position. Uh, I get requests from everything to uh, how do I get in touch with Verizon because my Verizon's not working, to how do I get my street paid, to do you know a mediator, do you know a plumber, do you know? And uh, I always keep it in my policy not to recommend anyone because uh, I don't find that recommendations work ever meaning if they're happy with the person, they'll never call me and thank me. If they're unhappy with the person, I become the person in the middle. So uh, yep. I always found that uh, recommendations are, are always challenging, um, but you are a name that uh, I've certainly heard uh, often as it comes to um, mediation. Um, so let's start by, I guess, giving us a little, you know, this is what you eat, breathe, and sleep. But uh, for many of us, uh, this is, you know, something new. We, we hear about getting divorced or thinking about separating. You know, the first call, I think, is to, is to the lawyer. Is, is that a mistake? What, who, how should we do the first call? Tell me about what a mediator does versus a lawyer. What's the process? And then talk to me a little bit about your practice. Sure, a lot of uh, a lot of questions rolled up into one, uh, and I'll I'll give some of that. And if I'm you know you want clarification, feel feel free. What I'm missing, um, you know, it's interesting. If you go if you go to a stranger in the street and uh, you kind of go go to him and say fill in the blank, divorce blank, um, the first word might not be the most appropriate word, but the second word probably is divorce lawyer or divorce court, that we have this association with uh, divorce and the legal process, the court, the adversarial legal process. Um, and, you know, there are choices out there. And I guess one of my uh, missions is to break that, that stereotype, uh, to break that, that default position um, and to, you know, realize that there are alternatives um, besides going to court. In fact, there are generally speaking a lot better alternatives. Um, and, you know, what, what comes to mind is an analogy of, um, of a medical situation. Let's see a, a back problem, right? If you have a back problem, you're not running to surgery. If you do, you're definitely going to get a second opinion. Um, surgery being the most risky, costly, invasive procedure. You're going to check out alternatives, whether it's a chiropractor or a physical therapist or holding your baby in your other arm or doing exercise, whatever it might be. Uh, we're not going to run to the surgery, the most costly, risky, invasive procedure. That's common sense in our society when it comes to medical concerns. But you know, when it comes to legal concerns, particularly around divorce, that, that starting point, especially when you think about a loved one, oh, you have to protect yourself. Get yourself a shark. Get yourself a, you know, a lawyer who's going who's gonna to protect you. That, that tends to be our, our default, our knee-jerk reaction. Um, indeed, sometimes that's necessary, but if you look at the statistics, usually it's not. In fact, in Bergen County, I heard this from uh, Judge uh, Misdol, who's the chief uh, uh, a matrimonial judge in, uh, in Bergen County, um, said that I think the statistics is 99.3% of all divorces get resolved without a judge needing to make a decision, without a trial, without you know, the full-blown litigation. And thinking about that, those odds, it's really a statistical anomaly that someone's actually going to go to court. 
Um, yet, the, the, again, that default presumption, presumption is, is gearing up for a battle that statistically is, is not going to happen. Unfortunately, it's not a harmless uh, journey. It, it, it has its costs, both emotionally, financially, on the kids, in terms of time, uh, and, and on many levels. Uh, so what my practice is about is about helping families go through this transition together in, in a problem-solving way and not against each other, not in a destructive way, not, uh, not going to court wherever, wherever possible. So I still have a unique practice. I'm one of the few matrimonial lawyers, uh, frankly, in the state that uh, as a practice does not go to court unless it's putting through and uncontested. So I, I decided after uh, a number of years working in a, a traditional matrimonial boutique firm in uh, Fifth Avenue in New York City, um, seeing the, the, um, the residual, seeing the ramifications, the consequences of, of this traditional process on families and what it does to kids and even to the, the parents themselves, um, I said, this is not what I want to do. This is not how I want to help families. The courtroom is not the place for families to resolve the differences. And I decided over 20 years ago, or about 20 years ago, that I was going to uh, focus my practice on, and it's a different, it's a different skill set. Um, I wanted to develop my skill set to really focus on helping people stay out of court, which uh, generally speaking is, is the best result. So that, that's what my uh, practice is, and I, I'm blessed to be doing this for a while and also be teaching others how to do this as well. This is a, a growth industry. Uh, more and more uh, people recognize the value of avoiding court, and frankly, many of them are judges and retire and, uh, and, and lawyers. In fact, the most common uh, um, retirement package for judges is they become mediators. Um, and any judge uh, that I've met, at least, uh, is very clear, again, that the, the court is a last resort. Yet, unfortunately, that's not how often we, we gear up. So that, that's my, you know, that's kind of what my practice is about. Again, divorce is a last resort. I'm not someone who uh, encourages uh, divorce, just the opposite. If a couple or an individual comes in and there's any question, I'm, you know, have, I, I, as, a, as a practice, as a principal, um, I'm looking to encourage them to work in the relationship, to go to the therapist, and we've had a number of uh, mental health professionals on this uh, call on, you know, previous weeks who have that kind of expertise. Um, maybe not therapy, maybe going to couples uh, uh, workshops. There's a lot of options there to work in the marriage, but if unfortunately um, it's not going to work, um, then the question is, what's the best way uh, it could, uh, you know, the family could transition, and that's that's what my practice uh, is about. Um, so, so you so ask a little. Talk about, I'm sorry. When you talk about educating clients as to the available options and helping them find the best process for the family, is that the options that you're talking about, or are there others? Um, there, there are a number of options. So if you if you picture like a continuum, um, on uh, and there are I would say five options that we typically speak about five or six uh, options. Um, the first, um, and I, I'd be happy if this was visual to show a diagram, but on the left side, let's say, is um, the the option where clients or parties going through divorce have the most control. Um, and that's what I'll call the kitchen table or sometimes the Starbucks table where they're sitting down together. They're working it out together. And if a couple could do that, that's great. Um, it's obviously costs a lot less. Um, they're in control. They're not, uh, you know, they're not being told what to do. Um, and if they reach an agreement, the satisfaction, of course, is, is the highest. Um, but as you might imagine, most couples cannot do that, uh, whether it's because of not knowing what the legal issues are, not knowing even how to approach uh, working things out, or because of the dynamics between them. It's just too difficult to have a, a productive conversation. So that's, that's on the left side of this continuum, option number you know, one, if you will. On the other end of the continuum is it all at war in the legal sense going to court. Um, and um, as, as unlikely or uncommon of, uh, for a couple to work things out on their own, it's probably even less likely 
uh, for a judge to work out the, the divorce through litigation. In light of the cost and the statistics I mentioned before, uh, very, uh, you know, very unlikely um, that, that that's going to play out. So then the question is between those extremes, uh, the kitchen table to the courtroom, what are, what are the options? So after the kitchen table option is what I, I would call the mediation table, where the couples are still working it out. And a lot of people confuse mediation, arbitration, so I'll just clarify. In mediation, it's kind of like the kitchen table because a couple is working it out on their own. Um, it's, it's their decision. The third party neutral that we call a mediator, unlike arbitration, the mediator is not making a decision. It's not a judge, it's not an arbitrator. Mediator is just helping the parties work out their own agreement. And because of that, it's really the closest option to the kitchen table. It's just the mediator's table, where the mediator is helping identify what are the topics to make sure nothing falls through the cracks, helping organize and gather and coordinate the information that's important to make informed decisions, talking about the law, assuming it's an attorney mediator. Uh, someone who's qualified to talk about the law, um, helps the clients and each side do the perspective taking to understand what's important to each side, what's important to the children, and provide that safe place to have that conversation. Um, and to provide options and talk about standard and what, what's common, but ultimately it's not what's common or what standard is what matters, what matters is what's right for this family. And the mediator will help them uh, have, that, have that conversation. That's kind of an option two. Um, and because of that, um, the parties are still in control. It's their decision. The costs are, are, are you know, much better than the other alternatives. Um, the, the amount of time it's, that's needed to take, there are you know, a, lot of, a lot more advantages than the other ones as you go across the, the continuum. So if for some reason mediation is not where someone starts or for some reason if it doesn't work out, traditionally, the, the, the more common way of, of starting would be the attorney-to-attorney -attorney negotiation. And that I would put as option uh, four, uh, the one before the court. So here, traditionally, each side has their own attorneys, and the attorneys are negotiating on behalf of other clients. Um, and they're typically doing it, what we call in the shadow of the courthouse, uh, in the shadow of the law, you know, based on the law, based on what the court would do. Um, and there's a kind of gamesmanship and, um, a frankly, an adversary thinking of trying to be successful. Um, and what does success mean? It means getting the best deal for your client, which means in this framework, getting the worst deal for the other client. And that sets up this zero-sum uh, win-lose framework, this adversarial paradigm, uh, how to reach, uh, how to get to a conclusion, a lot with, threading, with threats about going to co uh, court or actually going to court um, and using those kind of adversarial tactics to get the best uh, result for, for your client. And that, unfortunately, uh, typically is, is how many cases have, have been worked out. And because of that, um, that's actually where mediation other process came about, seeing the consequences of that kind of adversarial approach uh, on, on families. And that's why uh, mediation grew the way, the way it has. And then you have this middle option, which if I'm counting correctly would be number three. It would be right in the middle. The left would be, on the left side would be the, the kitchen table, the mediation table table. On the right side of this uh, third option would be the traditional adversarial negotiation and, and if need be litigation. In the middle, you have what we call collaborative family law. And this is somewhat new and not well known. And um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it because it's not there um, as much as we would like. And it's, it's kind of a hybrid, a synthesis, if you will, between mediation on one hand and the traditional representation on, on the other. Meaning that the, the goals, the ideals are similar to mediation, where a couple is trying to work things out together and not against each other. But the professional configuration and how to do that is, is more where it's not just working with one neutral party, but it's working with um, each side would have their own attorney who will serve as a collaborative lawyer. Uh, these are specifically uh, trained attorneys who are matrimonial lawyers, but are specifically committed to trying to work it out without court. And what they do, what we do in this process, which is, if you will, blasphemy for some traditional attorneys, is we actually make a commitment that we're not going to court. These are lawyers who are signing a, a binding contract 
that we're not going to court, go to court. Now, of course, the client, if things don't work out or if whatever is a client, always has a right to go to court. But the professionals involved are saying that I'm not here with this conflict of interest, looking to stir things up, trying to get and fight you know, to the very last penny or spoon or fork, um, and knowing that the more I fight, the more money I'm going to earn because I'm going to go to court, and that's going to be very, very expensive. But rather, I'm rolling on my sleeves. I'm making a commitment that I'm going to try to work this act together and not against each other. So this collaborative, um, this collaborative family law approach uh, is, is a newer process. When I say newer, we're looking at about 15 years. It's been just about 15 years where we started this uh, in Bergen County. Now there's about uh, uh, almost 10 groups around the state. In fact, Governor Christie a number of years ago, maybe five or six, um, actually signed uh, a, a statute which recognizes collaborative law as one of the, the viable options, legitimate options, um, as to how to go about getting divorced. And what's interesting thing is, before anyone goes to court, uh, in divorce court, um, the lawyer and the client has to sign an affidavit before you file anything in court or along with that first pleading that are filed, where you say, I as a lawyer have advised my client uh, the different ways in which this could be, uh, divorce could be resolved, including mediation, arbitration, uh, collaborative law, uh, et cetera. And the client has to say, I've been advised by my client, by my attorney of these different processes. So New Jersey, um, kind of the powers that be above, recognize the value of not jumping into a litigation process, not jumping to court, but trying to work things out together and, you know, therefore require um, everyone to sign off on the value of informing and advising clients of, of these alternatives. And, and would you say, um, what, like, what, what would you say the reason someone should choose collaborative law over mediation? Yeah, so that's a, that, that's a good question. Uh, so certainly the costs are different, right? Um, you know, I think in most situations, uh, I like to say the first stop to shop, so to speak, is is mediation. Um, you're primarily working with with one professional and it's cheaper not because you're working with a, a less than qualified uh, professional, not at all. Um, it's cheaper because the efficiencies that are built into the mediation process, you're working primarily with one. The mediator is encouraging the couple to do a lot of work on their own, especially when it comes to gathering information to avoid the discovery of interrogatories, which takes a lot of time, a lot of money to gather information. Uh, wherever possible, mediators are encouraging clients to do their own work. Um, so, uh, so one of the reasons is because you're primarily working with one uh, professional, that that's going to be cheaper. You're not wasting time in, in going to court or you're not uh, wasting time um, with, if it's not needed, of course, with the attorney to attorneys going back and forth. So the fact that you're working primarily with one certainly makes it cheaper. But there are other, there are other cases, um, even if money is, is not the issue, where one side could certainly be successful in mediation, but they want the support. They want the hand-holding. They want the guidance that um, having a lawyer by their side, yes, committed to doing this together in a problem-solving way, but they just want the more support. Uh, maybe a classic example of, let's say, take a, and pardon the, the stereotypes, but take a, a, a woman who's for you know, 20, 30 years been a preschool teacher. Uh, where she really is not in at all in the loop of, of finances. She hasn't written a checkbook. And again, this is a you know, ridiculous extreme stereotype, but this happens. And the husband, who is a Wall Street guy who negotiates million-dollar deals every day, you know, when his feet are on the desk drinking his coffee and you know, negotiating the business deals are just comes natural to him, that wife in that situation, uh, yes, it could be very successful in mediation. I have cases like that all the time. But she just might not feel as comfortable uh, negotiating uh, with directly with her husband at the table with a mere neutral. So having someone by her side gives her the sense of comfort um, that she could go in and, and negotiate uh, in a more comfortable uh, position. Uh, there are other times uh, where there might be trickier financial issues. Uh, again, not that mediation cannot resolve those trickier financial issues. I deal with very complex cases in mediation, and we bring in uh, you know certain professionals, financial professionals, as an example, uh, where there, there are needs for dealing with the trickier uh, elements. Um, or 
if there's a greater emotional volatility or, or more emotional challenges or mental health concerns. We're working with uh, just a neutral uh, mediator might not provide the containment to support that a uh, you know that that a particular case needs. So it does provide more more guidance. Now what's also interesting is that the collaborative family law approach actually has shifted. I would say in the past uh, ten years from a lawyer model, a lawyer only model, to an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary model, which is is really interesting. And I know having spoken with many mental health professionals, they're you know very excited to hear about this because if you think about it, the law and lawyers have often taken over the divorce process. But if you take a step back, we know that divorce is not just about a legal transition. It's a multidisciplinary uh, transition, right? It's an emotional transition. It's a financial transition. It's a parenting transition. There are many aspects to the divorce process. It's not just about the law. And what the collaborative family uh, law model does uh, collaborative divorce is it recognizes this interdisciplinary aspect of a divorce and where appropriate, where warranted, and certainly best practices is not just to have lawyer professionals, but uh, to bring in a mental health professional to serve as a divorce coach, not to do therapy, but to help um, help uh, deal with the emotional uh, challenges that often happens in these divorce negotiations, or a mental health professional to serve as a child specialist to deal or to bring in, if you will, the ch the child's voice into the room, which often you know is hard enough as we know to be parents in the best of circumstances, especially these days. Uh, but certainly going through divorce is that much harder. Harder when you know you have all the the insecurities and, and challenges and many levels uh, so to help um, the parents bring in the children's voice is a very valuable uh, role uh, for a mental health professional during a divorce also another aspect is uh, a financial professional whether it's to do tax and cash flow budget analysis whether it's to do uh, valuations of businesses or deal with more complex uh, assets like stock options or whatever it might be so they the idea is let's bring in, instead of having lawyers do all the work, which typically you know, often we see at a higher hourly rate, let's bring in uh, different professionals with the expertise that is needed to help usher this family get through this the best way possible, recognizing there's some cost efficiencies. Yes, there is more cost bringing in d more professionals, but the end result and the um, um, the potential of helping the family get through this with all these uh, multidisciplinary approaches um, has tremendous value uh, for families. And certainly in the more challenging cases, um, that's especially the case. Uh, you know, a, a challenging case with many emotional issues and parenting issues and financial, there's a lot there. But when you break it down with uh, each, uh, you know, professional expertise, it has a tremendous added value. So while mediation uh, can bring in these other professionals, um, as often the case, an inherent part of the model and the collaborative model is to work as a team. And that's why there's special training. Um, you know, while it might be a, a good marketing tool for any lawyer to say, oh, I do collaborative law, um, for those in the know, we want to look for someone who specializes um, in this kind of work. And there's special training. It's not just being a matrimonial lawyer, there's special training in how to work with, uh, with the team. So that was a long, uh, a long answer no, to your question. Was that was very good, you know. Um I was going to ask you some of the tricks of the trade, how to work out and how to work out an um an agreement that they strongly disagree with each other. I mean, I think you touched upon it a little in the beginning, but maybe you could uh I'll do a quick one. one. I'll do a quick one cuz yeah, I know be our, our 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 time is uh is running short. So uh, Einstein says, uh you can't solve a problem on the same level of awareness in which the problem was created. And this is very relevant to the work that we do in mediation and collaborative. Um, and uh, there's a, a book that describes kind of considered a, a, the Bible, so to speak, of uh, negotiation and mediation, a book called Getting to Yes, coming out of Harvard Negotiation Project by Uri Fisher, uh, uh, two, uh, two uh, professors from Harvard, one still around and, and one passed away a few years ago. Um, so in this book, Getting to Yes, and this is really one of the key elements of the field of mediation negotiation, is the distinction between positions on one hand and needs and interests on the other. So every, everyone in a, in a conflict comes in with a position. This is what I want, and the other one says this is what I want. Let, let me be very concrete in the context of divorce. Um, we, need, we, we, we have to sell the home. 
says, let's say, Dad. And mom says, what are you talking about? We're not selling the home. This is a home. This is where the kids are. We're not selling the home. So you have these two positions. You sell the home, keep the home. Sell the home, keep the home. Where do you go with that, right? You, you, you can't, like, split it in half. Uh, certainly one option is, okay, we'll sell it in six months. We'll sell it in, in 12 months. And sometimes that's an appropriate resolution. But on this that superficial level, what I call it on the position level, what each one wants, you can only get so far in, in working out a settlement. And what we do in mediation and collaborative is we want to distinguish between the position on one hand, what I want, and what are the underlying needs and interests on the other hand. And let's take a case of a home. So why might mom want to keep the home? Well, that, that's stability, that's security, um, that sense of connection to the community. That's a sense of stability for not just for the kids, which is the first thing that mom will say, but frankly, often you know, for mom herself. That stability, um, especially, let's say, a traditional mom's connection to home is very important. Um, so that's an underlying need and concern. And when you're working in good faith, it's hard to argue against stability, you know, for a person certainly for the kids. So what about dad? Dad, dad just saying, I want to sell it because I want to sell it? No, dad is saying, I want to sell it because I, I need, we need the money, because I want to have a place where I want to be comfortable with the kids and for them to want to come to me. Not if I'm in a small you know, studio apartment, my three kids are not coming to me, um, you know, coming in tents, and you know, maybe it's exciting as a camp out once or twice, but they're not going to come and spend regular quality time with me. So I, I, we need to sell the home so I can have a place that's comfortable as well. So when we shift the, the discussion from what I want, what I want, buy, sell the home, keep the home, to what's really important to both sides, the stability for the kids, to have a, a place to, where the kids are comfortable in my place as well, that takes the conversation to a whole different level. And when you're having that, that different conversation, that different understanding, and that's what I'm going back to Einstein, when you have, um, when you have the discussion, understanding on a deeper level, what's really important to both sides, it opens up opportunities opportunities to solutions that really work for the whole family and not just this distributive negotiation, okay, fine, we'll sell in, in six months instead of now or in a year instead of whenever it might be. So that's just an example that being aware of that distinction between positions and needs uh, is key to, uh, you know, to understanding this uh, and, and getting to the best resolution possible. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. So let's just sum up with just quickly as far as the pecking order. You have a couple that is uh, feeling that it's time to uh, change the route of their marriage. First call is therapy. That doesn't work. Next call is a mediator. And when they call you, it's their, your, or you or any other mediator. But it's, you're, you're both their mediators, right? You don't, you don't pick a side. Your objective is to sit through with them and try to resolve the differences not as far as in their marriage, but to give them the options, as you as you said it so nicely before. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. I, I would define my success um, not getting the best bill for the client like the traditional attorney, but how can we address the needs and concerns of all family members? as much as possible, right? It's limited resources, limited time with kids. There's only so much money and time, et cetera. But how can we address the needs of all family members as much as possible? That's the role of the mediator and the collaborative professional to help the family figure that out. Got it. Tell us how we get in touch with you. So um, my website, again, is uh, mediationoffices.com, one word, one long word in plural. Um, my uh, Local uh, phone number is uh, 201-836-0777, 201-836-0777, and uh, my email is adam at mediationoffices.com. Well, Adam, a difficult subject to uh, promote and a difficult subject to uh, for me to mediate or to, to uh, ask my questions, but I'll be honest, uh, obviously it's an important subject and uh, I believe that you are helping people and that's what this is all about. So continue doing good work. Hopefully Thank you. people don't come to you, but if they do, yes. continue doing good work. And uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. We really appreciate Th it. And thank you for your insight. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks for the opportunity to sharing something which I think is really important to get out there to help families uh, where it's needed. So thank you for the opportunity.